I saw something the other day, and some of you may have seen it too at this point. I, always, I used to hear about this performance all the time and this appearance by Michael Jackson and Prince at a James Brown concert, but I had never seen the video. So after Prince passed away, I went on YouTube and I saw, you know, I saw this concert that James Brown was doing. Michael Jackson was in the audience and James Brown brought him up and also brought up Prince. And James, just to, before we talk about what's in your book, just some perspective on the impact of somebody like James Brown where these two people who were iconic in themselves show up at the same concert. That, the, the odds of that happening are probably infinitesimal. Uh, yeah, well, uh, he had a tremendous influence on both of those artists. Uh, and his ability to use rhythm and sound and his ability to, um, to create the c cacophony of sound and this, you know, this, that, that, would, that became soul music and pop music as we know it was something that, Mike, that did not escape both of those artists. Although they, have, they managed to evolve and change over time, whereas James Brown in some ways did not. Uh, the book is called Kill Him and Leave, Searching for James Brown. Some of you might not understand what that title means. You want to talk about that well, for a minute? Well, uh, when James Brown was, was training Al Sharpton, and Al Sharpton sat at his feet for 15 years, he would tell Al Sharpton, you know, you, you, you kill him and you leave. He had, a, he had a way of when his band would hit and they would hit, and James Brown would stand on the side of the stage and he'd wait until the audience was like greased, totally ready, you know, and his band would always hit strong. And then when they would, when he saw the audience was just about to erupt, then he would come out and he would bang away. And then he would just, when he was done, he would just, he would leave. He'd get it, he'd go backstage, he'd get his hair, he'd sit under the hair dryer for three hours and get his hair fixed up. He wouldn't talk to anybody and then he would just leave, you know. Come important, leave important. You give examples of that in the book at some major events where he said, let's pack it up and leave. Uh, Zaire, the Muhammad Ali fight, and That's right, yeah. everybody was there. And, uh, and he left. Yeah. He left after he did his performance and knocked everybody out. And he yeah, and Mobutu was planning to give, uh, you know, diamonds. They said Mobutu was going to give diamonds to people, you know, afterwards and to the performers. And James Brown just said, I'm, I'm going home. And he went to the airport and... He sat there for four hours until his plane left, and then he went home. And even Al Sharpton, who was with him, and uh, oh, Al wasn't he? Al was ready to get them diamonds, right? To get the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do me a favor. I'd like you to um, to read just this portion to kind of set up our conversation. I I just sort of picked this out from the bottom of the page, where right. uh, uh, underlined to the to that whole paragraph at the top of the next page. And today the lawyers argue about his estate while the guy who gave us so much pride is buried in his daughter Deanna's front yard, his body having been deposited there while some of his children pondered the idea of his home becoming a museum someday. By the time that museum opens, if it ever does, the cultural history will have shifted so much that the tundra will be unrecognizable. And there's not, there's not much more to look for in this story, really, because the James Brown story is not about James Brown. It's about who's getting paid, whose interest is involved, who can squeeze the estate and black history for more. It's all in the hands of the executors, the lawyers, Brown's children, his ex-wives, his ex-friends. It's, it's about how that whole pot gets passed around. It's reflective of the sad, sad state of American popular emporium these days, where for the last decade, talent shows judged by stars whose names we'll forget five minutes past breakfast decide who has talent in America while songs like Bitch Better Have My Money climb the charts. Maybe that's the kind of song we always wanted. Maybe it's the song we all deserve. But it wasn't the song James Brown had in mind. So uh, just to give you some idea, we'll come back at uh, a later point in terms of what happened to the estate, which is a whole another story, a, kind of a tragic story. Um, <clears throat> as you point out in this book, there were already 15 books about James Brown and some by some very good writers, as you point out, also. So my question is, why did you decide to do number 16? Because I needed the money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean that, that was, that's the real reason. I mean, I got, you know, I was in a bad divorce and I was broke. And, and uh, someone from the family, you know, the, a family member, 
floated out this business of James Brown needing someone to write his story, and it came to me. And I had, I've, I've turned down books like that all the time because I've evolved into becoming a novelist. I don't really do nonfiction. But I love James Brown, and I'm a musician. I'd never written about music before. So, uh, so I decided to take it on. And I was kind of, I won't say I was snookered into it, but I didn't really know what I was getting into. Um, and then once I, you know, once I, look, once you take your clothes off, you might as well finish the job. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I just, I just had to finish the job. What surprised you most about when you got into it? I know one of the things you talk about in the beginning of this book is, and I can imagine this being the situation, because when you mentioned James Brown, everybody connected to this business, uh, and probably everybody in the towns that he's lived in has a James Brown story because he was so big in uh, just internationally, but certainly in the black community. And so now in talking to people, you have to figure out uh, who's telling the truth and who's, you know, who's trying to hustle you because people say, well, I can tell you some James Brown stories. What you got? You know, you, I'm sure you ran into that. I ran into quite a bit. I mean, look, you're, you've been in the radio business for a long time, right? 45 years, I heard yeah. you saying. So you've heard, you've heard, you understand the struggle it would involve to get a story like this. Absolutely. Clean. It helped that I was a musician because I'm not interested, I really wasn't interested in James Brown performance stories. Because as I've explained to you backstage, after musician plays, they don't want to talk about the performance. You can come to musicians and say, this is great. Uh, I love the way you do You know, musicians say, oh, do we eat now? You know, where's the hotel? Because, I mean, you, you're doing the job. So I wasn't interested in the job. I was interested in what happens after the job is finished. Because after the job is finished is where James Brown and thousands of musicians, particularly African-American musicians and country musicians to some degree, live, which is you're handing your culture over to the world and you're getting paid for it. James Brown got paid for it. And he suffered tremendously. He really suffers even in death now because his estate is tied up. But the musicians who play with him who I had the you know, chance to meet, suffered tremendously. And so I, I saw this as an opportunity to really illuminate the world of music from the perspective of musicians in particular, black musicians who create this culture, and they never get paid for it. And that's something that I really relate to personally. Um, and, and, I, and I, you know, the best compliment I get from people who read this book is when musicians read it and say, you really, thank you for telling my story because the story of black American, black American musicians are witness to the real elements of racism in America more than any other group, and I'll tell you why. Because they cook the grits, they cook the gravy, they cook the mashed potatoes, and then they get $50 to hand it to someone, and someone goes to Europe, and they take them same grits and mashed potatoes, and they feed it back to you as rock and roll, and they say, what a great guy that old guitar player was, and that old guitar player is, that's my friend. That's my uncle. These are people I know, and they die in relative anonymity. So that was my real payment for doing the James Brown book, in addition to, you know, getting paid. Getting paid, right, that helps, right. Uh, one of the things that, in terms of people getting paid that you mentioned, because you make references to uh, other musicians, a lot of musicians and, and their plight. Um, you made reference to uh, the Miles Davis kind of blues session where the side the sidemen, got $150, for, it was a session fee. And, right. And when you talk to these guys, the only one still living is Jimmy Cobb, the drummer, but they will say, or he said, at the time, he just looked at it as another session. They didn't know it was gonna be a, the best-selling jazz album of all times. Well, I mean, I'm sure when Mozart wrote his 41 symphonies, he didn't think people would be listening to them, you know, 500 years later, or 400, however long, you know, 1791, whatever it was. Um, Really, the, the question you have to ask yourself is, what is art worth to a society? And in our society, art and music is simply worth, not worth that much. At now. It's worth a lot later. Mm -hmm. Down the line. Because, because what you're doing is you're creating history. And we have no respect for history. In we have very little respect for history in America. Now, in history, that's more than 15 minutes old. So when someone creates something that's historical, we say, great, here's a small fee, and then on you go. So the thing is, what you, what you revere as history is the problem. Because as great as the Chicago Symphony is, they play music, but most of their music, I'm, I'm, I don't live here. Maybe they're playing American composers all year long, I mean, all the time. But we certainly know around Christmas, 
they're playing music that's written by people who have been certifiably dead for many, many years. Now, <laughs> Handel's Messiah, okay. So, yeah. I mean, I think that the real issue is how do you view art in society? Because that is, that, that's really the true question that lives beneath the story of James Brown and everyone like him. You know, one of the things along those lines, you mentioned uh, a guy who, uh, Louis Jordan, who James Brown really uh, sort of patterned himself after in the beginning. And I've read a lot about that because Louis Jordan's and his Timothy, Louis Jordan and Timothy Five, they used to really give a performance. They were all really great musicians, and uh, they were sort of the forerunner to right. modern day R and B. Um, and and as you point out, he died with not a lot of recognition and and not a lot of money. He he died. You you learn about Louis Jordan when you go see Five Guys Named Mo. He's just another in a long line of musicians whose work end up on Broadway 50 years later. In fact, the, the Timpani Five were excellent musicians. In fact, the, the, the drummer studied with the Timpani player here at the Chicago Symphony. This is back going back to the 30s. I mean, these guys could really play. And Louis Jordan was the forerunner of James Brown in the sense that um, this whole patter on stage and you know, like having fun and making the audience laugh and the tightness and the swing of Louis Jordan, uh, who was from Arkansas, he was a Midwestern. Uh, is something that was really had a great effect on James Brown and his musicians, most of whom grew up in the South. I want to talk about uh, the whole journey and the way it started and uh, finding the Gaines family connection uh, to James Brown. <clears throat> was that the first real break, the Gaines family? Because uh, James Brown was pretty secretive about his background and his family ties and his family tree and who he really was. So the Gaines family... Was that the real start of getting yeah, good I think, information? Well, when I first found out that James Brown, you know, the mythology of James Brown, he was born in a shack, and then, you know, like the movie, he was born right. in a shack, and his father was, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, just the usual Horatio Algier myth of, of jive that accompanies so many of these stories. Um, when I found out that the Savannah River nuclear site was the biggest nuclear bomb-making facility in American history, it was built at the same spot where James Brown's family you know, emerged from, I became curious and I wanted to find someone who had actually was a member of the family who could tell me, because they kept saying, well, he's not really from, he's really from Ellington. He's not from Barnwell. I mean, Barnwell's part of Ellington, but Ellen, he's from the town of Ellington, which is gone. There ain't no more Ellington. Well, why isn't there any more Ellington? Well, it turns out that James Brown was part of a large sharecropping family that existed in this town called Ellington. The town Ellington and five other towns were basically van they were just they were basically moved in order for the DuPont Company and the United States government to create the biggest nuclear bomb making uranium plant in the world. And it still exists. It's called the Savannah River Nuclear Site. It's 361 square miles of a bomb making facility. That never that had never been written about with regard to James Brown. And so when I found um, a, one of the relatives who told me the story of how Oscar Gaines, who was James Brown's great, great, I think great uncle, made his way, or he, what, what happened was Oscar Gaines was working on a chain prison Wait a minute, hold Just so you know that there's some humor in this story. This, when I read this story, I, I, I had to keep laughing to myself. I was in the room by myself and just laughing because it was such a funny story. But it also was a testament to how uh, African Americans had to survive in situations like that, thinking of something to help them get out of that. Tell that story about Oscar Gaines. Well, it's real, it's real, it's, it's a funny story that was passed down in his family. Oscar Gaines was working, he was in prison in Georgia for some crime or other. And he was working near the river and he kept saying, it's too hot, I can't work no more. And the, the, the guards were on horseback. And, and he said, I want to go back to the, you know, to the, in, to the prison because I can't work. And they said, if, you, if you're so hot, we'll cool you off. So they took him. They did it like this. They grabbed him by arms. And, they, and he said, please don't throw me into the water because I can't swim. And they said, well, you're so hot now. We're going to make here. Now, now cool off. And they threw him into the Savannah River. And then to their surprise, Oscar Gaines could swim in, indeed. <laughs> and so he swam clear across the Savannah River to the South Carolina side, <laughs> and he never came back. <laughs> and that's how James, Fram, James Brown's family got started in South Carolina, because the South Carolinians and the Georgians hate each other, and they don't care if some old colored guy comes on our side. We hate them Georgians anyway. So, 
See why I kept laughing after I read that. It was like, you know, survival mode to the max. In this book, you do mention, let's talk a little bit about Get On Up, because the movie that, about James Brown. Um, and the documentary, which both things were produced by Mick Jagger, right? He co he's one of the producers. Co on both. One of the, that he co-produced. So, generally speaking, you're thinking, did you see that movie? Yeah, I saw it. I felt the movie was about 40% fiction. I thought the action was great. I mean, the acting was great. But uh, most of that movie, especially in the beginning, just didn't happen. He never walked into a room and fired his gun into the ceiling. He put his gun in the corner and asked the people not to use his bathroom. And he didn't lead police on a high-speed chase. He led them on a low-speed chase. And when they were done, they shot his, into his pickup truck some 17 times, twice into the gas tank. And then when he went down to the police station, one of the cops, no one ever figured out who, punched him in the face and knocked out one of his teeth. I mean, the whole business of his portraying his mother as a whore, his mother was, to my knowledge, his mother was never a whore or a prostitute. Um, and his father wasn't some, you know, violent guy. You know, they had his father singing a song straight out of, straight out of the Mississippi Chain Gang recordings of, uh, what's his name, Alan... Um, Lomax. Alan Lomax. His father wasn't. His father was like a, like a real fun guy who... You just gave him a pork, some skins, and some hot sauce, and a deck of cards. Mr. Joe Brown would be happy all day. He wouldn't have nothing to say to anybody else. You know, because so, when you said that, you know, when James got successful and he, he, he bought him new cars. And he bought his father new cars. His father would drive a new Lincoln around and stub the cigar on the, in the seat, in the leather seat. He said, I don't care about no car. <laughs> he just was a happy person. He wasn't. Listen, the betrayal of African-American life in Hollywood is, is a discussion beyond this. But I'm just done with seeing, like, the big, fat, you know, the big, fat black mom. I mean, aren't black women shy? Or, you know, do they, some, like, some allergic to, you know, you know, some allergic to seafood? Or instead of just, like, you know, big, fat Tyler Perry, you know, you going to... And that's how they, you know, that's, that's his, his own honey. was a you special boy. I'm tired of that. I mean, one of the problems with doing a book... One of the prizes I exp explained backstage is that I, this is really my last appearance to talk about this book. Because what this book has done is, if you're a novelist, if you're a creative artist, finding out this kind of information and living with it, because you have to live with it to write it well, it takes part of your innocence away. And you have to have that in order to be a novelist and a person who writes to the commonality of, of man and woman. So, yes, I think, and this, the fact is Mick Jagger was co-producer of that movie. He was co-producer of the, uh, the James Brown documentary. The same publishing company that runs Mick Jagger's, uh, administers Mick Jagger's uh, publishing, uh, administers James Brown's publishing. I mean, and James Brown, according to Charles Bobbitt, didn't, didn't even like Mick Jagger. You, talk, you talked about an instance when the Rolling Stones were young and performed on the same stage that James Brown did. James Brown uh, opened or whatever and smoked them. Oh, he killed. Well, you, you see that there's a mo there's a scene in the movie where James Brown is in the dressing room, and Charles Bobbitt said he didn't have a dressing room. They didn't even give him a dressing room. He had the rehearsal in the slope floor of the auditorium, and Charles Bobbitt said James Brown went to the band. He said, "I want this. We're gonna make this one," and they said, "Okay, Mr. Brown." And if you can just you can Google the Tammy performance, 1964, where he wasn't allowed to close the show. The Stones were supposed to close the show because they were the new rock band of the moment. So he preceded the stones, and then he just burned the stage to cinders. I mean, he smoked it. I mean, it's all there for, and you know, it's all there for, listen, the truth is in the music. The truth is in the music. That's all that needs to be said. The, um, one of the things that Charles Bobbitt, who had been with him for some 40 years, talked about, he asked the question whether or not uh, why people, why James Brown didn't, let people know him or know who he was. Um, and Charles Bobbitt answered that question by saying fear. He didn't want people to know him. Can you talk about that for a minute? Well, he, he was really, of that, yeah, he, he was afraid. He, he had a lot of locked doors. You know, he was a very sensitive person. You know, Michael Jackson is, when you see Michael Jackson, what you're really seeing is James Brown without being raised in the South and without all the ba mental baggage of being a poor, sharecropper kid. But James Brown was very, very sensitive. And that's why during the course of his life, he addressed people as Mr. and Mrs. and he insisted he be addressed as Mr. Brown. But he had a lot of psychic wounds. 
that he had brought from his childhood to his adulthood, which were never fully healed and, and never worked out. So, yeah, he had the normal fear of, what well, normal, but the normal abnormality of, of you know, self-hate of some black folks where, you know, white folks have, they, their red lights work all the time, and their lettuce is greener and their rice is crisp or whatever. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't think... White man's ice is colder. Yeah, white man's ice, it, it is colder because I had some back <laughs> It was very, very cold. Really had it. No, but, look, I mean, that's just the malaise that, you know, that he had. But um, despite that, you have to look to, to what he created, you know, which was, you know, he, he, was, he was a work ethic person. He believed in work. You know? He believed in, in, uh, in pride. And, 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 and he was a southerner. And Southerners don't, and I'm sure people from Chicago, because Chicago got a whole lot of South. I mean, with all due respect, I'm going to say, you know, South has a whole lot of South. I mean, Mississippi Chicago, to Chicago. Yeah, it has a whole lot of, so, you know, the whole thing of pride and not letting people know you're hurt, you know, just being, being, being prideful and being strong and not letting people see how weak you are. That's a, that's a Southern thing, you know, and, and he had a whole bunch of that. He was a, very much a Southern man. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, one of the things that is, is talked about in your book was that he was a pretty hard taskmaster. Uh, some of the band members, according to your book, described him as mean. He didn't pay enough. Uh, he was outright cruel, and, uh, and many didn't like him. Uh, he would find them for minor infractions. And as I told you backstage, I saw him do that one time in the dressing room. <laughs> he, he find a guy for closing his eyes while he was playing the guitar. He said, you, you weren't watching me. I might have made a move and you'd have missed it. Or people think you're on drugs, you know. $50. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, look, if I had seen James Brown in, as many times as you had, I'd probably have a different take on it. But my take is different and for this reason, because I've been a musician for a long time. And I've worked with some people, and I've, and I've run a band for a long time. And you know, if you have a problem with the band, it's not that you can like, go to the human resources department and work it out with the guy. Yeah. You got guys who can play and he wants a lot of money, or you got guys who can't play who want a lot of money. This guy can really, he, he can really play, but he gets drunk all the time. This guy can't play that well, but he, cuts, he can cut the part. And, you know, he can't cut the part, but he's a nice guy, and you know, he's got kids. So, I mean, he had to manage a lot, and the musicians never saw the promoters and the DJs and the record companies. They didn't have to deal with that. And they weren't like angels. They would some drink, some smoke. I mean, these cats, are, these are guys I love. And by but, the way, you know, this is true of a large band, whether it's James Brown's band or Duke Ellington's band. If you run a band, you've got to deal with a lot of issues. That you just, I wanted to not make that only point. That, you know? Not only that, you've got to deal with that if you're dealing with the Chicago Amph Symphony. You know, and the third violinist gets a hiccup, and she you know, gets mad at the conductor, and then she goes, to, and I, they probably do have some kind of human resource department, but she's going to get a pension. But, you know, Clyde Stubblefield, who lives three hours from here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who created that, you know, that was Clyde Stubblefield. Now, you can, or you can get in your car and go three hours to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I bet you if you had some enough money, you could get him to play for you because he doesn't get the kind of pension that someone from the Chicago Symphony. And should he, as, a, as an Oberlin graduate, I could, as a train musician, I say absolutely he should. And by the way, Stubblefield was in, in the business in the music business, he's considered like one of the great musicians of our time. Not only that, he's his sampled, you know, he has sampled, Subberfield has sampled more than any living or dead drummer. And Clyde Stubberfield learned to play by hearing the choo-choo train out his window, Chattanooga, Tennessee window of his mother's kitchen. And he'd hear the train go, now that's creativity, that's art. I mean, anybody can sit down and read me, I mean, with all due respect, it's, it's, it's you, know, to, you know, to recreate someone's sound or to, look, if Guys and Dolls and Dream Girls and the Motown show were so hard, how could, why can't they, why, why can they bring it out of New York and bring it to Chicago and do it and then take it to Iowa you know, if their music's that hard? But if you can sit down and emulate the sound of a choo-choo train going out your back door and make somebody buy that music, that's art. Creative music. <laughs> Creative musicians um, sort of, uh, you know, have that same categorical circumstance. And Miles used to say that he heard music and everything. You know, like he, he, if he was at a baseball game, he'd hear something that would have a rhythmic connection. You know, and he, it was always in his head. So it was, you know, from that 
came creativity of whatever the next thing was because he was always hearing something that, uh, you know, that uh, clicked in as it relates to his music. Well, I mean, the, the thing is that there's art and music and song in everything. You know, when I was in school, I read Stud Circle's book, Working. And he, he talked to a lot of people here in Chicago. Stud Circle. Yeah, Stud Circle. And, uh, and I remember reading about the stonemason. And he was a guy who was a stone, was my favorite story. And he'd say, he'd drive past his house, the stonemason, and he'd say, I know where every stone is. Because he fitted the stones, and he knew where every, so, and I said to myself when I read that, I said, you know, I, I reflected on that a lot because I, the reason why I had effect on me is because in music and in writing and in any kind of building, there's always a moment where you say, I think I, I, fit, I fitted it together. It, it, it connects. There's a connectivity to art. And so with anything, whether it be music or writing or stone masonry or carpentry or plumbing, the connectivity is really the thing that powers it all. And so when we hear music, we're just hearing our souls connect with someone else's for that you know, five or seven minute period, or if it's an opera for a two hour period, we'll help along. And then when the, when the music ends, the problem that I have is when the music ends, the connectivity that the music pushes into your soul ends when you walk out the theater. It shouldn't end there. It should be like church, you know, the minister says, you know, there's certain chords that they teach you to play. And, you know, in, in, in gospel music, you know, there's something called subdominance. When the minister says, you know, I want you all to remember what I said, you know, book of numbers and have a good week and remember. And then, and then he pauses. You're supposed to jump up. You, know, you jump up, you play the, the third on the bottom and you play the chord. And, and it sounds like a gospel chord. They call it a gospel chord. Aretha's fabulously talented at doing that kind of stuff. And then you just feel it. And then you just move on, and then you just jump up to sub subdominant third again, and then you jump on. And what happens is when people take this formula and make it into music that's, you, where you, you know, bubblegum music, then you're using it to sell soda pop and sneakers and stuff. And this is like the devil's at work. <laughs> Funny you should mention that, the soda pop and sneakers. You, you put in the book that uh, when James Brown fell on hard times, he wasn't making a whole lot of money, and uh, he probably could have had the option of doing some commercials for beer or for sneakers. And he said, I, I don't want to do that. I, it's not going to help kids with, because he was always big on education, go back to school. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah. so he wouldn't, he just, yeah. he, I don't want to do that. I won't do those commercials. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do any beer. Or, he, he never, even when he was broke and he had no record deal, uh, there were certain things that he just didn't do. I, you can, can you imagine some of today's artists, you know, following that same, same line of. No, I can't. <laughs> it's just, it just because the money is so big, uh, and money would have been good for him because he was James Brown. Well, let me, you know, here's a, here's a rhetorical question. How much money do you need? You know? But I mean, in situations like, very few people would do what he did when he was broke, and they, and they come to you with that offer. Uh, probably 99% of the people who are in this business would take the money. Well, you know, musicians, white and black, whatever, whatever stripe, if, if they love music enough, Oftentimes, they'll teach people just for free because they know where they're giving them. They really understand that the riches are in the music. I mean, if, you, if you're playing music because you want to get a Nike contract, you're not a musician. You're just someone who wants a Nike contract. You know, you're not an artist. An artist does art because they cannot not do something else. James Brown could not not do something else. He was born to do that. Then he happened to get paid to do it. But he realized toward the end of his life that... Well, he realized a few things. One of them is that he had, he had chased his base, great band away. You know, his great band, the, the band that you remember when you were young, that you right, saw. Right, Pee Wee Ellis and... Uh, Pee Wee Ellis and uh, Fred, Fred, Fred Wesley. Uh, Fred Wesley, Macy Parker, these yeah. guys. Jimmy, Jimmy Nolan, yeah, great guitarist from Oklahoma. Uh, he'd run those guys away. And, uh, and then his later bands were... They were good bands, but they, you know, they were basically playing Fred Wesley's music and Jimmy Nolan's music, and especially Pee Wee Ellis. Um, but he also realized that he had been put here to do something special, and that's what he wanted to do toward the end of his life, which he wanted to just give back. He was so appreciative. I mean, he had done a lot of bad things. It's the thing with women, you know, his relationships with women were horrible. But, um, you know, he wanted to give back to the community that gave him. He had enormous respect for fans and people who paid to see him sing. I want to talk about some personal relationships that you go into in the book, uh, 
one of which was his good friend Leon, Leon and his Austin. wife Emma. I mean, because you know, when you look at when you look at his history in terms of what you've written, he didn't have a lot of people he was real close to. These people were really his friends, seriously. I mean, and they were very, very close, and they were from back home. Yeah, they were from Augusta. Well, Leon Austin, when James Brown first came to Augusta, after his, his family, um, his parents divorced, and he ended up in Augusta, and he was staying with his aunt on the bad side of town. He, when he went to school, he was snot-nosed, dark-skinned kid with you know, you know, nappy hair and so forth. But Leon Austin was a, a light-skinned, well-to-do from a middle-class family, and they became very close. They both loved music. Leon Austin taught him how to play piano. And, um, well, how to, you know, he taught him his first piano. Uh, and they became lifelong friends all the way until, uh, until uh, uh, James, uh, until Leon died. And, and mm. Leon respected James's space. Right. He would never, add, I mean, even as a child, you know, when, they, when, when Leon Austin's mother first saw James and Leon together, she took them both into her kitchen, made them take their clothes off and gave them both a bath. She said, I can't stand neither one of y'all. And... <laughs> And then when she dressed him up, she said, now nah, I can stand, y'all. And um, James Brown never forgot that kindness. You know, Leon Austin was a very kind person. Um, and, but he also understood that James had a lot of pain. You know, he called him bra. They called each other bro, but down south it's bra. Yeah. Hey, bra. Yeah. So y'all he get understand that? that, you know, I mean. Bra, you know, y'all get that? Okay. Yeah, I'll get a translator. We'll get a <laughs> third person in the sign, bra. But... Um, so Leon never talked with James about certain things. Now, at one point, he wanted to play. He wanted to be in James' yeah, band. And yeah. James actually produced a couple records for Leon Austin, which were actually very good records. But what Leon Austin had, James Brown didn't have. He had one wife. You know, he had one car, one house. He had a barbershop. He had a good life. And James would ask him, he'd say, well, you know, why do you want to come out in the music business, see? You don't want to be in the music business. He would even ask guys who wanted to join his band, Joe Davis, the trumpet player, was working for the post office, and when he got into the band, James Brown said, why do you want to leave the post office to join my band? You got a good job. Charles Bobbitt had a good job. When, when Charles, Bobbitt, Bobbitt was his personal, his road manager. That's right. And yeah, he, he had a good job uh, laying track for the yeah, working New York subway job. system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, because our time's a little short, I do want to ask you uh, uh, about Al Sharpton. Reverend Al Sharpton, and I knew about Sharpton's reverence for James Brown, and some of the story, but I, didn't, I never knew how deep it went. You explore that whole relationship with Reverend Al Sharpton and James Brown, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, well, I, re I met with Sharpton, or the Rev, three or four times, for three or four hours. And he talked quite, a, you know, he knows more about James Brown probably than any living person. Because when he was a teenager, after James Brown's son's Teddy, he knew, Te Al Sharpton was friends with James Brown's son Teddy, who you actually met. I did, yeah. Um, and when Teddy died, uh, he ended up meeting James Brown. And then James Brown basically adopted Sharpton as his kind of adopted son. And he traveled with James Brown for close to 15 years. He left New York as, Reverend, as Al Sharpton, the kid preacher. And he came back 15 years later as Al Sharpton, the hellraiser. And a lot of, when you see Al Sharpton talk, even the way he combs his hair, all of that comes from James Brown. And you know, when I, and when I read about that in terms of the, the hair thing and his uh, sort of tribute to James Brown, I always thought, I said, yeah, that's, that's kind of silly. And then I read all about their relationship and you know, the high esteem that he held James Brown in. James Brown was like a mentor, father. Uh, Sharpton said he didn't really have a father figure. Right. And then James Brown became it and the, the relationship over the years was just absolutely incredible. And a lot of things that James Brown told him in terms of how to do things and how to move forward, he did those things and they worked for him. So he was tremendously dedicated. Well, Al Sharpton also could do things that James Brown could not do. I mean, he could say things James Brown could not say. I mean, he could go 360 degrees. He could talk to a president or he could talk to some of those gangsters that James Brown ran around with right. that, you know, they had 38s in their pocket. But he also, and James Brown could do what Al Sharpton could not, which is that he, he understood African-American life and he understood how to connect to people in a way that made them feel really, really good inside. 
Um, one of the things that we have to talk about, and some of it is really tragic, the, uh, uh, the two people that, the two white people that were major in James Brown's business affairs uh, was... Uh, Buddy Dallas. Buddy Dallas, who was his lawyer, and... Uh, David Cannon. David Cannon, who was, who was his accountant. Right. Uh, what happened to Cannon at the end in terms of the story that I read was pretty sad. I mean, there's a guy who, when James Brown actually asked him to, because he was James was in tax, had tax problems, right. and he went to this guy and said, you know, and by the way, something you mentioned earlier about these two white guys were Southerners, and there was a, even with the history of segregation in, in the South, there's a certain thing. They had this connection right. um, that only Southern whites and blacks who could communicate right. understood, right. and it was different. But these are the two guys who were major in his uh, in his business affairs, and uh, at the end of the day, with Cannon as his accountant, ending up in court and losing everything that he had, and uh, just it was really sad. It's one of the saddest legacies of the whole James Brown story, and one of the great ironies, and one reason why he's, his life is a metaphor for American life, because David Cannon should have never been going to jail, and David Cannon, in my opinion, was innocent. I mean, James Brown trusted no one with his money. David Cannon, he trusted David Cannon because Cannon could be trusted. And Cannon got him out of tax trouble and he ended up, when James Brown died, essentially what happened was, when James Brown died, he left none of his money to his children. He left all of his money in an, a trust that he set up to educate poor black and white children in the state of South Carolina and Georgia. That was 10 years ago. It is now 2016. James Brown died in 2006. In that 10 year period, not a single kid from either state has received a single penny of that money because the, 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 the estate has been tied up in lawsuits. And the first attack against the estate was against the trustees of the estate, which were, Jan which were David Cannon, Buddy Dallas, and Judge Bradley, who was a black guy who died. So Dallas's career was essentially almost ruined because he was a lawyer. He lost all his, just about all of his practice. He had to rebuild his practice. David Cannon went to jail, and they, they couldn't ex easily explain things because James Brown, when it came to his money, this is the thing. Even today, if you ask Buddy Dallas, where's James Brown's money? The money that, that, is like, that, James, that nobody knows about. And Buddy Dallas said, when he asked James Brown where his money was, James Brown wrote on a yellow legal pad, and he turned the pad around so Buddy Dallas could read it, and the word was dig. Dig, yeah. Dig. By the way, some of the stories in the book about the money, because James Brown grew up poor and had this thing about money, when he got, when he, he had money that he would stash in different places everywhere. He'd bury money, he'd leave money under a floorboard in a hotel or something, and then come back a year later and, and, and get and large sums of money. He had money everywhere. Uh, so it was very difficult for, for Cannon to, to follow that. As a matter of fact, he had some money. This uh, guy who's an accountant, he had uh, some $400,000 in Cannon's safe. Yeah, he had, up to, he had at one point, he had up to a million dollars in Cannon's safe. Uh, and then um, what happened was he, he basically owed the money. This is Cannon's version of it. He owed the money to Cannon. And then when he died, Cannon wrote himself a check for the account, for the amount that James Brown owed him. And that sent him to jail. And they're still trying to squeeze money. They're still claiming... You have to remember, James Brown's estate is tied up in court now, and it's administered by the state of South Carolina. So, Even that movie, Get On Up, all of that stuff, the documentary, all that was administered by the state of South Carolina, not by James Brown's family or anybody who loved him or even knew him. Most of those people who administered the state, including some of the 90 lawyers and the four, those who filed up to 50 lawsuits, most of them didn't even know James Brown. And by the way, all those people were getting paid, right? So, oh, my so, God. So the $100 million over, what, 10 years? So well, the latest, the latest. So it's going. By the way, just to show, it's going like this. Well, the latest figure they gave to the IRS is that the estate is worth four point seven million dollars. Now, I mean, I, you know, I'm not an accountant. You know, I'm not. You know, it's like I said, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I mean, I'm not an accountant, <laughs> but I mean, how do you go from having an estate that's worth an invest, you know, somewhere between 100 and 150 million to 4.7 million? And I can tell you how, because if you ask a question in South Carolina, you'll see so many, these lawyers are magicians. They just, they just blah, 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 they just, you know, you can't. And so between the lawyers, his last wife, because he married one of his background singers, 
But don't do that if you ever become a musician. No, I'll probably try not, try not to do that, you know what I mean? <laughs> By the way, when he married her, she was uh, uh, already married. She had not divorced. She right, was she husband. was already married to a Pakistani guy and hadn't divorced him. But the state of South Carolina still considers her right now, as of today, you know, his, his widow. And then it's between her and his children and the state of South Carolina, they got that, that estate wrapped up pretty tight in, in court. And, uh, and by the way, I think uh, the good news out of that, uh, in terms of family relations, and if, it, if this is holds true that was in your book, is that um, Terry, the other son, was not part of that. Um, he has two sons, one named Terry and one named Daryl, and they're two, two, two of his sons have refused to participate. In, well, Daryl initially participated in the lawsuits against his father's estate, and then he changed his mind and backed out of it. Terry has consistently, James Brown's oldest son, has consistently declined to participate in the lawsuits. In other words, he just wants his father's estate to, to go as James Brown wanted it to go. And Terry knew his father very well. As you know, you met Teddy, his oldest son, who died in an automobile accident. And Terry, Teddy and Terry were very close, and they were very close to their father. And, and Terry was very close to his father until James Brown's death, as was his first wife. His first wife was very close to him, too. Uh, and and it, you, sh you know, people should know James Brown was married four times. His first marriage ended in divorce. His second marriage uh, ended in divorce. His third wife died during lip liposuction surgery. And then his fourth marriage was to his background singer. But his first wife, he was friends. They were, they were close friends until he died. And she never asked him for anything. After they divorced, she told him, I need, I need a place to raise our children. And he bought a house. He bought up land, he built a house, and then she, um, she worked for 30 years in a factory. She never asked him for anything. What was interesting, too, was that um, Charles Bobbitt, who was his road manager for all those years, except for some years when he, he uh, worked for the government of Gabon for right. a few years, but Charles Bobbitt was with him when he died, and he wrote in the book that he told, that James Brown told Charles Bobbitt, the reason I don't have you listed on anything is because when I die, this is going to be a mess, and you don't want to be in that. True? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and unfortunately, Charles Bob is very sick now. Um, he's, not, he's not well at all. He's he, in his 80s, right? He's in his 80s. His wife died. I think he's 81. <clears throat> he's, not, he's not well at all. So I don't know how much, I mean, I, I can't, you know. I'm not a doctor. I just played one on TV, so I can't tell you. But no, I mean, Charles <laughs> Bob is, is not well. But he, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I had a chance to talk to him about James Brown before he, uh, before he got sick. You know. Charles Bobbitt really knew James Brown well, probably as well, probably even better than Al Sharpton because he was with James Brown before Sharpton came and he was with him after Sharpton left. Full disclosure, when uh, Charles Bobbitt used to be known as the $100 man, uh, he was the guy who carried the briefcase with the money after the concerts and also seeing the disc jockeys. Uh, that was true, about the $100. I was a disc jockey back then. <laughs> <laughs> Statute of limitations, that was 40 some go. years ago. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do some, uh, some questions uh, from the audience, can we do that? Did uh, James Brown have trouble dealing with record companies and, uh, and companies that were sponsoring his concerts? in terms of not getting his fair share? Two, the two different things there. His concerts, first of all, he, had, he, was, there was, he, was, he, did, he was working for himself at some point in terms of promoting right. himself. Record companies uh, did not sponsor the concert. That was only like Motown that did that. Uh, so what, get, in terms of getting his royalties from a record company, that's a whole different issue. Well, it's a, it's, that's, a, that's a complicated answer, but the, the, the short answer is that like most artists, he signed bad deals when he first started out. And then when he, got, when he became more and more established, he began to establish control of his publishing, music publishing, which is really where the real money is. Um, and so uh, toward the end of his life, he, he got a lot more justice out of his record company deals. In terms of his live performances, he always got what he wanted, even, toward, even when he was not. I mean, he didn't, actually, he didn't get all, when he was big, he got, Big money, anywhere between. He got up fifty to hundred thousand dollars performance. When he was, when he declined to the, in the eighties, he was getting as little as five or seven thousand dollars a performance. 
And keep in mind the five to seven thousand dollars of performance out of that, you also had to pay the band, transportation, the, band, the bus driver, yeah, all of that. Questions right there. Thank you. Could you speak a little bit about James Brown's involvement with the civil rights movement? You know, I think of um, Black and I'm Proud and when that came out and the impact that it had, and I wondered if you have any insight about what inspired that. The song was written really by Pee Wee Ellis uh, on the spot at 3 a.m. In, in L.A. when James Brown wrote it on the back of a napkin. Um, he, he had enormous impact on the civil rights movement. I mean, when Martin Luther King was, was, was killed, uh, he was called by the city of Boston. To, he had a concert was scheduled, scheduled in Boston, and they wanted to cancel the concert. And, when he, he, and not only did they not cancel, but they wisely televised it. And they said that kept Boston from, from, from burning. Washington, D.C. had a similar experience with James Brown, and so did Augusta, Georgia in 1970 when a, and there was a very controversial police shooting. So he was all, I mean, he really embodied, the song Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud really embodied a lot of that civil rights movement. It was almost, almost at the height of the movement. Because, and in fact, it was. If you, one could argue 68 was the height of the movement. And that's when Martin Luther King got, got shot and so forth. But, um, but was killed. But um, I think what he, like most artists, there's a side that we don't see. Like, you know, he says it, and you know, everyone's yelling and screaming and hollering, and then at the end of the day, he gets a letter from the IRS or something. It's a whole different world because the audience is no longer there to say it's all goody, you know, goody gumdrop. So it was, I think the, 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 um, the back, there's a word, the, 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 whatever, the backlash from that oh, the backlash. was pretty considerable. By the way, um, have you ever seen the video? The video has, with these kids singing, um, <laughs> say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. They're white kids and black kids. In, in that in that video, and he's in his in the money that he wanted to leave for education for kids back in his hometown in, in Georgia and South Carolina, his stipulation that was that poor kids need to be helped with education, whether they were white or black. Absolutely, now, that was his position. And the other thing too about say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. James Brown had gotten to a point where his music was so popular and wasn't Motown because he's always back and forth with this Motown versus the country boy, James Brown. But James Brown's music was played on the big stations, uh, like here in Chicago at WLS or WCFL, until Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud oh, yeah. came out. And when that record came out, that was it for a number of years. That's interesting. They stopped, they stopped playing his music. They weren't gonna play that. So it, it did cost him, and um, I've read some other, some other, uh, uh, Articles where it said that he had some concerns about because uh, you know he at some because at that point he was appealing to a mixed crowd of people blacks mm -hmm. and whites like James Brown's music and he became concerned that after say it loud I'm black and I'm proud I'm proud it would have an effect on his concert crowd so mm -hmm. there you go uh, is that why it came out with the uh, I think it came out with a song after that about America is great to me. I'm, I can't remember the exact title. Living in America? No, not living no, in America. Yeah, I, I know much what you're talking about. I, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think so. Oh. Uh, I, but I, the, the, no, I don't think so. That, that's the straight answer to your question. I'm not 100% sure. I think the song he came out with after, I, but you know what? I don't want to get into the litany of what he did after it because I, I'll probably be wrong. But I think the overall push, even after Say It Loud, was open up the door, I'll get it myself, you know. Um, I don't think he, he ever backed off it completely, but I, I, I can't recall the next song. You know, he did go through the whole patriotic living in America business, because he believed in America. He was very much, very much a very patriotic American. And by the way, that, when that song came out, the Living in America to go along with the Rocky movie, he, that was the first, what I read was that that was probably the first time that he accepted an outside producer to come up with something that wasn't his, but he was, his management convinced him, he said, listen, you need to kind of reconnect with a white audience, and if you do this and connect it with this movie, so he, re he, he related and he actually recorded that, it became a really big hit, put him back in the game. Mm. Could you speak a bit about the issue of his mindset with the injustice that he received in his incarceration, I, I, what I find to be injustice, how he was before and how he was after, if you have any 
insight um, into that? Well, from what I understand from Cannon and, and uh, Dallas is that he was pretty, well, and Al Sharpton visited him almost like every week. He was very happy to get out. Uh, he didn't feel that he had done anything wrong. He felt like he had just was going, you know, he did what any good god in South Carolinian would do. He went into this place with his rifle and said, don't use my bathroom, this is my building. I built it, I, well, I, I own it. And so he, he, he felt there was some injustice, but you know, there's a certain point in your life, you know, when you're black, where you just say, I'm not gonna fight that fight, because there's a fight every day you can figure out, you know. So he just, once he was done, I mean, there was some pretty bad things that happened to him. Like David Cannon said, when he went before a judge and the judge kept calling him uncle, you know, and Cannon was so insulted by that, and, Cannon, and Brown just said, look, just leave that alone, just, you know, let it go. Um, was he bitter about how the state had treated him? That's a difficult question to answer because he loved South Carolina. But he was cognizant that it was, you know, that it had a long way to go when, when it came to race relations. And I must say, if you're from South Carolina, I don't mean to insult you, but I have never seen a place more racist in America in my life. I mean, it's like 50 years behind the rest of America. South Carolina is just something else. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, it's got the nicest people. Of both type, both white and black, nicest people you ever want to meet. But in terms of its government, it's like a different country. I mean, you can look at the rulings in the James Brown's estate, and it's simply, I, when I was in Georgia talking about it, they said, oh, yeah, we understand. We don't mess with them either. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, Cannon, the uh, accountant who went to jail, uh, in your book, he said that the way the state legislature is set up and the whole political system uh, in South Carolina, that even if you're a Harvard law school Harvard, graduate, yeah. you won't get you won't get far. <laughs> and a lawyer, you can't get through that maze that exists in the state of South Carolina politically and legally. So they're just chopping up that money piece by piece. Listen, the the, the Attorney General of South Carolina right now is in, involved in some sort of controversy. You can look it up. This attorney, this attorney general was one of the ones who tried to rewrite James Brown's will. He's the son of the guy who, when Barack Obama said, was speaking, and you know the guy who said, you lie? Well, this attorney general, that's, a, that's his son. So these are, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just telling you who he is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. I um, feel that James Brown was, you know, not only an uh, icon musically, but an icon to the black movement at that particular time in history. Um, and you had Fela in Nigeria, and um, I, I understand they once met that he had a lot of admiration for Fela and his music and his social mu uh, movement in Nigeria. Were you aware of that, or is that a fallacy? Or? Oh, I was aware of it. I, I was aware that Fela had a lot of respect for James Brown. I don't know if James, you know, who knows James Brown. I mean, he, James Brown wasn't the kind of guy you could go up and say, do you have a lot of respect for it? I mean, if you were James, if you were, the, you know, J John Johnson of Johnson Publications, you could ask James Brown something like that. But uh, I don't know, but I, don't, I know that a lot of African musicians had enormous respect for James Brown, uh, both musically and, and, and socioculturally, I suppose, or sociopolitically. What about Europe? What, what about Europe? I mean, he's a star. James Brown is a star in Europe. I mean, he is a, even now, he's, a, I mean, he was widely revered. His concert in Paris, it's, you can get it online. It's incredible. I mean, he just, I mean, the French, you know, they just close their eyes and blow a kiss when they're talking about James Brown. I mean, that's one of the points made in the book is that um, this thing back and forth with he and Motown, because at the time, Motown had all the hits. I mean, they were pumping them out, but James Brown, just James Brown and his band, they were, they were equal in terms of his individual output and people buying records. And so it was pointed out in the book that overseas, I mean, people knew who James Brown was as well as they knew who Motown was. I mean, it was James Brown, James yeah. Brown. Well, James Brown, you know, was, saw himself as a kind of one-man hit machine you know, against the light, bright, bright Motown people. Now, now you, you and I know that Motown was not anything but light, bright, and right, but he just, he pre-printed them, he just put them in, in his mind that way. So it was like Joe Frazier, with James Brown being Joe Frazier, and Motown being kind of Muhammad Ali. He I felt they didn't, they didn't really know about 
the things that he had been through on the Chitlin Circuit. Because does everybody know, know what the Chitlin Circuit was? Okay, these are small venues, small towns, and small locations where um, he had to, a lot of bands had to play, black bands in those days, and having, trying to find a place to sleep, trying to pl find a place to eat was a major problem, especially in the South as it relates to segregation. So his thinking was, he traveled that road and Motown, they in Detroit, they didn't travel that road. Right, and they, you know, they had Diana Ross and the Supreme, you know, they gave him speech lessons, they told him how to talk to the press Correct. and all that, you know. James Brown was country. I have a friend, my friend, my friend from Philly, you know, uh, you know, he was playing with Stylistics and their bus broke down overseas and he said, James, Brown, James Brown's bus broke down. This is back in the, I guess it was in the 90s. And he said, the man said, well, they got to use y'all's bus. They got to get on board. And he said, and the Stylistics band was all North Philly cats. North Philly cats were kind of like, I don't know, Southside Chicago or Harlem, you know, yeah. black dudes. So he said, when he said, when James Brown's band got on here, on the bus. I said, what were they like? He said, man, them cats was country. <laughs> he said, even the North Philly cats were saying, man, those are some country cats. <laughs> yeah, there was always that difference, you know, in terms of perception. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this. Um, I had a question about the uh, 1972 endorsement by James Brown of Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. which would seem to be quite incongruous with his social activism and his, um, his otherwise great presence in the black community. Will you comment on that, please? Well, I don't, you know, I, I read about that, and um, look, he, he, was, he was also friends with Strom Thurmond. I mean, um, I, 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 let me put daughter. it this way. I, you know, people, just because someone's a great artist or a great musician doesn't necessarily mean they understand politics that well and know what they're doing. You know, when Hillary Clinton, you know, shakes hands with the bus driver, you know, there's a photo op and she's shaking hands with the bus driver. It means, blah, blah. you know, he, the president wanted to meet the guy. The president happened to be Nixon. I mean, who doesn't want to meet the president? You know, he went, met the president and, of course, his black fans were furious. And then, of course, your, your, your white liberals and your white intellectuals, you know, they wrote papers about it probably. But James Brown probably forgot it 13 minutes past breakfast. I mean, <laughs> you know. Well, but, I, but I mean, it was an interesting point in his life. And Sammy Davis Jr. as well was another one who, who, who was suffered from this misconception, not misconception, but suffered from his political, his political beliefs. Here's the, read that I, here's the read that I got on it. Uh, James Brown was very much um, a kind of open the door and I'll get it for myself, like his song said. He even talks in, in the book uh, James does about, James McBride does about, James Brown going to a, uh, a shelter, I think in Harlem, for men. Right. And he looked at the men and he said, you know, all oh, able-bodied men, what you doing in the show? You need to be out somewhere looking for a job. He told the guy, I said, look, let's change, if we change clothes right now, and you, I put on what you have and you put on what I have, I go out there by this evening, I'll have a job doing something. So he was very much in that, with that mindset. With Nixon, it was that, uh, you know, that whole uh, bootstraps, help yourself kind of, you know, bring yourself back, step up in your community, and create your own job, all of that. And his mindset, he, he heard Nixon talking about how people need to help themselves and not be on welfare and blah, blah, blah. And he believed in that concept to the degree that what Nixon was saying kind of fit that mode. And he connected with that. That's, I, I did read that. Well, yeah, and I, 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 I close by saying that don't, don't assume that, that's an excellent question. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, oftentimes people say, I'm glad you brought this in. Damn, why did you bring that up? But, <laughs> man, I almost got out of here. Don't assume that because someone, don't assume that because someone's a great artist and even if they sing great songs that they actually live it. You know, Bob Marley lived it, really. Miles, to, to, to a great degree, lived it. Some people don't live it. They just talk it. James Brown, for most of his life, more or less lived it. And that's it. Ray Charles lived it. And I'm convinced, you know, at, at my age, that if, in the black community, if, the, if you don't, if black people don't move back to the black community to make it better, it ain't never going to get better. So I, I admire the fact that these men, all of whom I name, have given, and including Michael Jackson and, and Prince, <clears throat> whatever their politics, Lionel Hampton's another one who's a Republican, exactly. whatever their politics, they gave back to the community so that people could stand up on their own 
and they didn't preach a whole bunch of hate towards white people. They just said, you have to do what you have to do. I think that's what I'd like people to remember about James Brown, that he really wanted people to do well and to get along. And in order to get along and be a true neighbor to a friend who's white or black, you have to be able to stand on your feet and address him as a man or woman and say, this is who I am. Thank you. Nice to meet you. That's really what I'd like you to remember about him. James McBride, kill him and leave searching for James Brown and the American soul. Round of applause, please.